Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. I'm Carol White, the president of the Corning Museum of Glass, and I'd like to welcome you to this evening's Behind the Glass Lecture. This is a series that we offer on the second Thursday of each month, except during our busy summer season. And it's a series presented by artists, scientists, and other significant cultural figures on topics related to glass. And tonight, I am very pleased to introduce to you Tom Patty. Tom has been working in glass since the 1960s. He is recognized for his original and innovative concepts using glass and has received international attention for his small-scale sculptural glass works and large-scale public commissions. Unlike many studio glass pioneers of his generation, Tom did not focus on traditional glass techniques, but embraced the use of industrial technology and sheet glass in his creative process. Tom earned his BFA and MFA in Industrial Design and Architectural Theory at Pratt Art Institute. While at Pratt, he was involved with Experiments in Art and Technology, a project co-founded by Robert Rauschenberg to develop collaborations between artists and engineers in order to explore the relationship of art to science and technology. By making this investigative approach a predominant theme in his work, Tom has continued to innovate architectural and, and industrial glass processes that are entirely unique to his artwork over the past four decades. Tom's work is included in private and public collections worldwide, including here at the Corning Museum of Glass, at the Museum of Modern Art, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Victoria and Albert Museum, and the Louvre. In 2015, Tom returned to Corning following his selection as the second specialty glass resident artist for our new collaborative residency program with Corning Incorporated, and spent part of last year exploring new glasses and the processes used to form them. This evening, Tom will present Space, Real and Imagined, an autobiographical introduction with a description of the work done during this specialty glass residency. So please join me in welcoming Tom Patty. Thank you, Carol, and uh, thanks everyone for coming this evening. It's uh, very thoughtful. This is not a lecture, it's a talk about what I did at Corning and uh, a reflection back on my background uh, starting in the early 60s. Um, the, the, actually, the, the first image you see uh, starts to focus on what the residency eventually becomes. And it's, uh, it emphasizes my interest in, in sort of the laws of nature, uh, forces that exist in the, in the universe. One, of, one dominant force, of course, is, is gravity. And I use that as a, a vehicle to develop forms. Um, I was born in the, in the early 40s. Uh, Simultaneously, uh, nuclear weapons were developed. Uh, interesting thing, and you see that image on the on the my right, uh, the atomic bomb at Trinity in New Mexico, and the shape of the Earth. You know, the scientists, artists look for patterns and shapes, similarities and uh, find avenues of recognition to get pathways into understanding the, the, the universe. But I find it ironic in those two spherical forms, uh, the potential uh, that exists in, in both. You know, it was an exciting time. You know, I'm in art school uh, eventually, and um, uh, the Vietnam War has started. My friends are leaving. Notes are coming back that, that they've been killed in Vietnam. Civil rights movement uh, reached the apex. Um, so it was an exciting time uh, landing on the moon. So these things, if you believe that art is the experience you live, uh, then recognize that these were experiences that shaped the work to come. 
When I was a child, I lived in an industrial community, uh, at General Electric in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, was the major employer, and our home was abutted the property. Uh, it was actually the landfill and one of the sites for uh, General Electric. But every year, they'd have an annual open house, and um, they developed man-made lightning. And I would go over there as a child um, every year with my, with my friends, uh, the hooligans in the neighborhood, if <laughs> we go in there, and uh, they you could only see it once. They'd do it several times a day, but you're only supposed to stay, see it once, and then they'd move out, move you out, and move it in. But we found a place to hide inside here, so we'd be in there all day uh, and be able to observe the lightning and them setting it up. And, and it made such an impression on me that, you know, I, I think, and it's probably so, that I, you know, I dedicated my life to this sort of wonder and magic of industry and science. Um, at the same time, you know, eventually I went to school and explored these ideas. You know, the upper image is one where exploring the, the senses, what, how we see and understand the world through our sight, hearing, uh, taste, smell. And so this is a complete environment uh, that you could walk around in that it would influence all those senses. And the idea that you could in spontaneously, using uh, materials, create uh, spontaneous sculptures or forms of interest, they had no meaning other than the form or the experience of making them themselves. Now, I'm showing this. This is on popular demand. I didn't want to show this, but I showed it once over uh, at the uh, research facility. And, um, and then I got calls, people asking me to show it again. So. Bear with me, there's the first furnace uh, I built. I had a school for children in a small rural community called Savoy. And the kids would start at six years old and some as old as 14. And then I had some high school dropouts that were still looking to find their way and there's 16, 17, 18 year olds. And we had a little community there um, and if you couldn't blow glass or I couldn't demonstrate it, I developed this technique. Uh, and this little, it's actually a, a technology of, of um, softening a plastic straw. Uh, and then, you can see it's a very intense work. So I know, don't, it's like, get excited here. I'm not through. So I was like, it was like this mini lab. It was called Savoy Lab School. And I had a chalkboard in the back and we discuss all these complicated issues, you know, with math and science and neighborhood problems or whatever. And, uh, and we had a great time. So. I was like the magician in the, in, the, in the facility here. I actually started in a bar with the bar straws. <clears throat> I, I got a little tiny bubble and then, you know, I, I kept pushing it further and further, the idea of anticipation, expectation, thinking that that was the limit of what it could do. But as I kept working with that little bar straw, it was bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, then I had to shoot pool, and I had to stop down. And it was an uneven thing, so I eventually put up my own setup at, in my studio. The idea of these inflatable, flexible membranes that had that could be open-ended. There was no top, bottom, or side to the work, and that's if you. I'm basically giving you the foundation for the work to come that you'll see. Uh, this that concept stays with my work to today. So the idea that I could open up, I could create these framework structures, and then on the interior put a, a membrane system and then using air pressure or other gases, inflate them, attach them, um, and then disconnect the materials, the, the cable structures and so on. I would get a terminal form of a, a, a very precise fixed dimension in a very controlled space. 
And the idea was that this would be, uh, this was going to solve the global housing problem that we were facing in the, in the 60s. Uh, so I spent 15 years after school working on these kinds of things with the materials that you see, very versatile materials. Um, and then I began to work with transparent and translucent uh, materials and some opaque materials that where you could see the exterior and the interior of the form simultaneously. So you could see how the house was on the exterior, the home site, how it rested or worked in the terrain. But then you could still see the interior components of the structure. Uh, and so these are some of the kinds of forms and drawings I was doing at the time. This is uh, late 60s. So I began to experiment almost, well, probably close to 10 years. And um, the piece right here, there was, someone said there's a thing at Corning, New York, you know, and all, you know, anybody working in glass should go to this thing. <clears throat> so off I went. I never had sold a piece of work. Uh, I really didn't know too much about what was going on in the glass scene at the time. Fortunately, you know, Toots gave me some advice early on. <clears throat> and um, so I brought this piece, and it was a, a sh sort of a, a show and tell, or you put these objects out. And it, it got a lot of attention because at the time, most people were blowing glass or bending sheets of glass and so on. And so this was actually made of sheets of glass that were, later, that were layered together and then expanded. And um, it included many types of glass in the same form. And some are thought to be incompatible, but the way I laid them up in a gradient relationship, they were actually uh, compatible materials. And the glasses and the way they were done, it just took several years to discover those kinds of things. So that, actually there's a catalog book that's just printed by the museum that uh, shows this object in, in, that, in that book. And that conference, that object <clears throat> was unfinished because I didn't have the typical glass studio with coal work, working, finishing equipment. Everything I made was experimental. It was, uh, I would make it, photograph it, and destroy it, mostly. So <clears throat> that object still existed because I was still working with those colors and that shape. But it wasn't finished. So when I came to Corning with the piece, I asked someone in the, uh, in the Stuben, could I go in that room with you guys and finish polishing up this piece. And they all looked at it and they asked me about it and so on and they let me in, I finished it. So actually it's now part of the, the Corning collection. Um, Carol mentioned my interest in art, science and technology and architecture. In 1980, I received a commission by Gen Electric to do a large-scale sculpture for the opening of their New World Headquarters. I'll move, try, try to move more quickly. What I did was this, this large red piece. Um, I had cut my hand, and I sent that color sample, and I had over 2,000 pounds of plastic made to match that color uh, in Mount Vernon, Indiana. And I used that in the sculpture, that red. But I believe, having worked with glass, I was able to create a, a uh, a, a sculpture that was unique to the world of plastics at the time. It has a quality that's unlike glass, but very much unlike plastics. So that represents all the plastics that they were producing at the time at Gen Electric and became, like a, ta like, uh, like a tabernacle, this piece uh, represented uh, 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 a sort of spiritual element in the, in the vocabulary of industrial <laughs> technology, I guess. But that red glass, that red plastic, stayed with me. After I finished the project, you wonder what, what retains, you know, what you go away with. And I try not to think too much about it in the beginning and just let myself react to it and see what stays over time. And it was the color. So I found a red glass that I could work with. And I developed a series, and I worked with for several years with, uh, that included red or red-orange-like glass. In these vertical riser forms I developed, this is called split riser. <clears throat> and uh, at the same time, 
I would, I would always look for complementary relationships, where I would work in a vertical format one, one day, and the next day I'd, I'd work in a horizontal thing, so I could find sort of this sort of innovative relationship and make discoveries between those, those two, the vertical and the horizontal, and how the glasses would uh, exist in those conditions. And you can see the, um, this is the same object, but just I began to look at how you move. This object from the side is totally different. Here it's a solid red-orange color, but from the side it's, you can actually see that there's only four layers of glass there, and you can deconstruct the form from the side. That's all intentional. This form here is you just shift 30 degrees, and it opens up that shape. So I began to think, well, <clears throat> you know, the Greeks, you know, and the, the forms were static, the, the platonic solids. And it wasn't until, you know, contemporary times that we think of space differently. And I imagined that a progressive concept of the cosmology of nature would allow the object and the viewer to sort of coexist, that you could move and the object could change uh, appearance. This is a similar one where in the, the, the lower piece, these forms don't exist at eye level and then change your eye position relative to the object and all these other shapes appear uh, in the form. Uh, there's a couple of things that the, the shots, our studio now, our, our home. I have co-working facility, large sheet glass not, not unlike a commercial glass working facility. Um, and the other is our residence, where I have a hot working facility in the, in the, in the white, the barn, the tall uh, structure. And you can see my oven it weighs 22 tons. So it's not some, a portable thing that I can run around with. And uh, new ideas require often new tools and new processes. So as my ideas changed, I, I went out and sought those kinds of tools that could best uh, address the concerns I had. I'm very fortunate. Uh, uh, my partner, my wife, Marilyn, uh, uh, works, we work closely together with this. She's really my uh, collaborator on the project. Much of what you see here uh, was produced by Marilyn. People at, at the research center know Marilyn and uh, that we're inseparable in trying to accomplish a single project. She deserves a lot of credit for what's happened. Uh, I received a large commission at Owens Corning uh, Fiberglass in Toledo, Ohio. <clears throat> These large projects will take up to two years. So I worked with glass fibers, um, and I was, had access to the company um, globally. So <clears throat> I did a lot of work, a lot of experimentation with glass fibers. Um, and they became uh, elements within, their, within the, the New World headquarters. Uh, it was cast, um, laminated, elongated. It was uh, a lot of chemistry involved and colorizing fibers and so on. Another large commission uh, is for the MTA. And that idea about starting to move the figure related to the object, I think of them in these kinds of spaces now, where light and the object become uh, both independent but contiguous. You can't have one without the other, but they can coexist and uh, sort of accomplish two different things with the uh, thinking of the, with the viewer. Here's the interior. Let me sh show this again. The exterior is, th this particular glass is reflective. And it's reflective in reflected light. In transmitted light, it casts uh, shapes that are encapsulated in the sheet glass. Those shapes are projected in specific ways into that environment. So 
you start to see the, the, this relationship between the object and the environment that it creates. Um, and that's something that interests me. So that the object that you can be, the object can be behind you, but the presence of it can be in the foreground that you're walking into. So the object and the environment uh, ha have become one. Um, I'm gonna move more quickly. This is the Mint Museum in Charlotte. Um, where th this common wall works both on the exterior and the interior um, of that environment. Uh, there's quite a bit of work in, in Miami, and uh, the vision was to in, in, uh, enclose an entire um, structure, building, with the artwork. So again, it, it would be uh, inseparable. You couldn't distinguish the architecture from the art. And uh, we did quite a bit of work there, that project and, and this one here. And you can see now light, it's, it's, it's not an artificial light source like a small object would be contained, but it works on a cosmic level. It's the sun moving over the structure that gives you the visual e experience. And this is, it has, it, it, it uh, and its ability to be seen several miles away and from the air. Um, and it's because it's related to the sun, it's, it's, uh, and it's never the same. It changes infinitely over the course of the year and the, the conditions in that environment. This is the uh, a museum environment. Uh, I was asked to close off an area to redirect the uh, the uh, museum goers and I cre created one side again you see the reflected surface where the the the, the images are, are of the reflected viewer and the smaller shot on the other side is the opposite side where it, the transmitted light is the the image itself I don't know, the reflected and the transmitted, it's, it's, for me, it's, it's, it, it, it represents our existence, be able to understand ourselves in our own time. That's both through the reflected light and the transmitted light. Uh, it's always about what the viewer is looking at. Uh, this is another one in a, a, a museum environment. I, I put it low to the floor so children would be able to uh, approach it and look at it. And the, and the larger image in the, of the background is actually the, a detail of it. I wanted something more abstract, something that was broader, that would appeal to people's imagination. That was Neil it, going like by I in the car. And see possibilities <laughs> of exploration and invention. I wanted to begin a sense of motion and flight, but the excitement I wanted to convey with a, with a sense of color and movement here, with this sort of rhythmic motion of color through the object. As people walk through the space, I want them to be able to, to stop, take a second to look at the, the work in here and to be able to explore it on a larger scale, seeing the larger objects and shapes, and on a smaller scale is to be able to walk up close to it and see other shapes emerge. This, the sense was the more you looked, the more you would see. But that if you didn't look and you just were moving through here quickly to catch your flight, that it would still have a, almost a subliminal impact as, on the experience. It's an emotional experience. Two years from beginning to end, you know, there's a lot of anticipation, expectation, and you have to have a lot of trust. You know, I have to believe in what I'm doing is gonna work. Um, without any guarantees. I was fortunate that BART went along with all the changes and conditions. It evolved very organically. I'm proud of it and I'm proud of the experience. The interesting thing here, again, is, is about the viewer and the relationship to the, to the work, is that for the first time, I'm able to put, the, the, put myself sort of inside the work. We're always looking at objects. You go through the museum, everyone's walking around the museum. You're outside of the work. But 
on this scale, which has been a, a, an achievement I've been trying to get for a long time, is I'm actually now inside the work. In the smaller scale work we're talking, we were looking at those, here, I'm always imagining what it's like on the inside. But it's always imagining what it's like. And I'm going like, well, what if I was on the inside trying to look out of those things? What would I see besides myself looking in? <laughs> It's, so now I'm working on the idea of encapsulating the, the viewer in a, in a specific space. So this is one where the train comes up, people, people get off the train, and they rush off and they go into the airport. And so this sort of uh, cosmic infinite space that I'm creating um, begins that uh, way to, to get off the planet surface. Um, and now that I'm off the planet's surface, I'm at, I'm at the Corning Research Center, where I meet Neil, Matt, Dave, and um, other people I'll mention and show you. But this suggests that kind of thing. It's that sense of energy and force that I, I wanted to begin to experience. Uh, the, the residency is a very special, very unique uh, opportunity uh, not for anyone, uh, but of course artists in particular. Um, here I am at the first day making my, en at the entrance. Um, it's an awesome environment. You, the, you can see the scale of the, it's not too intimidating if you're a visitor there. <laughs> uh, I was fortunate, you can see the, the little sign on the door announcing that this would be the offices of the residency. So there was a, a, a obvious intent to make uh, us comfortable there and the opportunity to be free and explore ideas. Uh, we're uh, given offices there. Marilyn and I each had an office. Um, before the residency began, uh, uh, Glenn Cook, uh, my spiritual guide through this whole experience, brought two scientists, uh, a scientist and an engineer, to our facility in Pittsfield, and where I made, made an inter introduction of my work and showed them the, the studio and stuff like that. So we got acquainted. So uh, it was, you know, I was comfortable uh, getting a sense of what Corning people might be like, and, I, and hopefully it would work the same way. Uh, and Glenn and I are still friends. There we are, up there handsome guy he is. In, in the lower corner, there's Neil and me, and there's, there's Matt Deneka. Hard to get the glass away. I decided to work with a particular glass. I isolated two people. I needed an engineer and a scientist. I got Neil and Matt together and with these glasses and a particular machine that we found in, uh, on, the, on my original orientation through the facility. I believe tools can create innovative collaborations. So I saw that tool, and um, Neil said it was something they were curious about, but they never had an opportunity to use. Um, it was just a conversation. And then, as I got further along in the project, I realized that, well, maybe what I really want to do is take the glasses that Matt is developing with this machine that Neil uh, and Dave McEnroe uh, are involved with in the lab but had never used and to see what we can do together. It was an, the idea was that it wouldn't necessarily be all about me and, uh, and them trying to answer what I might need to accomplish something, but in fact that we would work together. I wanted a way to have a true collaboration and to maximize the potential of, of them as uh, the experience that they have in, in, in Corning and, uh, and their creative experience and how it could be used in, on a project. So I began to explore ways that that could be done. And you can see the, the machine in the uh, lower left. It's a, a machine that rotates at a very high speed. Um, and if you put glass in it, the glass will spin, gravity will force it out, and it will often climb the walls. You can rotate it at specific angles, 
to create a range of, of uh, sizes of the form, or the lengths of the form. I, I believe, after working with it, that, that that thing has tremendous form potential. What you'll see me working with are tubes, I make these tube shapes. But in fact, the, the, the tube is the most obvious one. I, I believe there's a lot of hidden potential in that thing. It's, it just takes um, time and experience working with it. While we were looking at that machine, uh, Glenn was taking me around and, and we were experiencing other kinds of things that were happening. You can see Eric from CMOG came over and we started uh, fooling around with some glasses that, that uh, were in a studio at the research center. Um, so there were people from CMOG that would come over um, and talk to me about what I was doing and vice versa. There was a, a, a time when I went to, to the CMOG or the Corning Museum of Glass facility uh, where Jesse was, uh, Glenn introduced me to Jesse and I, we needed some mold material for a project that we were exploring. And so Jesse uh, showed us how to mix up some material quickly and make a mold for stuff. And uh, you see Jeremy there. And eventually we started formulating our own castable materials, and um, you see John Medford here from um, a whole different location uh, where they do factory development, refractory development here at Corning. And so we started playing around with materials that could be used as um, uh, related to the experiments we were doing. Some of the early experiments were wonderful expressions of uh, just what the hell is this thing going to do, you know? Um, we managed not to kill ourselves, um, and the fragments, the charts of pieces, um, were the most revealing um, because we could look and explore them. Making a cylinder became the easiest part of it, so that wasn't hard. Uh, so we began, I began to think about, well, how could we influence the surface of that shape? Let's just pick one sort of obvious thing to try to do. and. Um, and I was thinking about it, thinking about it, and we're making something, and God, we couldn't get this thing out of the mold, and the thing's burning and smoking. Somebody caught on fire running around the room, and I'm throwing water on them, and and, and <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, and we're struggling with this thing, and, and Dave McEnroe runs around the corner. He comes back with this other material. We put this in, and we're eventually able to remove the glass. But in hindsight, what it did was it provided this... Uh, this, uh, this texture on the side. And so the combination of these thin wall inserts uh, with this technique, you could provide, you, you could create some, um, I think there's a lot of possibilities for some interesting shapes. That thin wall material can be flexible, it can be reshaped. Um, I, I think there's a lot of potential with that. Um, the cylinders got larger, bigger, more complete. Um, so I knew that was, you know, that was sort of a dead end. It was too successful. It was, it, it, everybody started to understand, you know, what, it, what we would need to get a certain kind of thing. Uh, and I wanted to, we did, we used blue to try to trace it, try to understand actually what was happening with the glass. And you can see me at the lab working with things. By now, mass starting to, develop his glasses and, and bring parts of the glass down for me to look at and think of how it could possibly be used. So we began to melt his glasses uh, and pour them and look at, make some color tests and combine them with other materials and start to bring, put them inside of this um, spinning device. Um, you can't see them, but uh, there's some people, I'll mention their names later on, but Matt Preston is, uh, he's in here somewhere hiding around. The sense of, uh, that, that what I talked about was gravity, the forces in nature exerting um, on the f forms that we see and that we, we live with. In, 19, in 1994, um, the comet Schumacher-Levy 9 uh, 
was for over 500 million years was orbiting around the sun into the deep solar system. It eventually, it took that long, eventually it was picked up by the gravity, the gravitational uh, pull of Jupiter and got pulled into its orbit. And it just, in that image, and it was, rec it was recognized in 92, 94, they predicted that it would, on a specific date, that it, those, that, that comet would fragment from the gravitational pull. It would start to deconstruct, and it would impact the planet. <clears throat> and that was recorded, and I don't know if anyone saw that, but it was, uh, the scientists and the people that were involved with it at that time, it was, uh, it was a miraculous event. <clears throat> And you can see the impacts in the structure here. And this, this is Jupiter. And these are the impacts on the surface. This is filtered, these images. It wouldn't look like that, that bright in that color. But they use filters, camera lens filters, and all kinds of things to be, that can distinguish the gases in that environment. But it will also it, it distinguish these impact areas they're huge there, but the original impacts were much smaller. That's them coming through the gaseous cloud uh, of the atmosphere. But the, each impact on the planet was the size of the Earth. And, and the other slide I, image I use with this is what we did with uh, Matt Deneka's uh, glasses that he was developing in his laboratory. I, I broke them up and just threw them into this environment, this, this spinning environment, uh, with no, no idea what would happen. I asked Matt, he said he didn't know. Neil had no idea what the hell would happen. You know, Mike Preston, he thought they were going to stick to the side of the glass. And Matt was right, they did. And um, so I said, you know, that's interesting, uh, is to not work on the exterior of, the, of, of an object, but to work on the interior out of the form. And, uh, and I thought that that soft interior surface, the way to get the, the, the drama of the particles or the fragments to the surface was to not heat them in any way, keep as much heat off those fragments as possible to keep the sharp edges that would refract and control the light on the interior of the form. So you can see what I'm showing you now is, is the process. Uh, again, I, I believe that you know, the new tool creates a new form of collaboration. Uh, and uh, so under, believing that, you know, I sort of stuck with this thing for a period of time. You know, and, you know in the six months, I actually worked here about 24 days. Uh, work time in, uh, at the research center. So I think in that period of time, I think we accomplished a great deal. Uh, not just what we did, but in fact, there's probably nothing we did that it actually is a finished thing. I came here with the idea that uh, there was under no obligation to, to actually make a finished object of any type. And I was under no obligation to do to work with the, the, the tools and techniques and materials that I was uh, accustomed to in my own studio. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be exposed to a glass and a process that I had absolutely no idea uh, and no experience with and to see what I could do. I wanted to test that, uh, in my own uh, potential to respond to this environment and, and the way we were working. Uh, you know, I was fortunate. There, there were a lot of people that uh, were you know, influential in bringing me here, Charlie Craig, uh, it, it was a significant force, and when everyone said no, I think he probably said, well, let's think about it again. Uh, and, and there's my friend and partner making this, Neil, there. That was the first one we got, so we were pretty excited at the time. Uh, so I sort of set this little goal, let's see if we can learn enough about the process and, and working together that we can actually make a shape. The shape was a sort of a testimony of, yes, we, we've accomplished that part of it. Uh, I'm still working on the lighting, but I have a lighting advisor. Uh, I'm working with David Morse, uh, 
he, I showed him the cylinder, and right away he said, Tom, you, you've got you've, you've to do this with the lighting. You've got to do this to maximize the potential of the glasses we were working with. So I have to find Dave and tell him I'm, that's what I'm working on now. I've been working on trying to light these things uh, since I left the residency. But in the office, you know, the second image, you can, you know, here's Matt Taneka and I, you know, going over the work at the end of the day. So there's this constantly in the morning sort of reviewing what might be done, doing some of the work, and then later in the day um, talking about what was accomplished, you know, what we need to do the following day, um, getting a sense of direction for it, but also trying to understand it and look at it, almost look at the thing in a different way than what it actually appeared to be. Uh, in, the, in the beginning, you know, we're saying, well, these glasses, they would say, Tom, these glasses are not compatible. You know, you can't put this glass with that glass. And I say, this is not what that's about. We're not trying to make a form that's complete and successful in terms that it's not going to fall apart. So we started putting uh, the glasses that were available at the time, uh, a clear glass, and you can see the pink ones are, are is the glass that Matt developed in Neo, and we're, we're talking about it, and we're looking at them with the light. But what's happening is, because they weren't compatible, the whole object's fractured uh, because of the, it's called a coefficient of, of expansion. One glass wants to expand more than another or less than the other, and they, the, the result is a crack uh, in, in the glass. It's, it's wonderful because it's an obvious sign that something's going on there. And, but what was interesting, as I saw all these fractures, I realized that you know, the way the light was entering and, and going through the form, it was, it was uh, exterior light was refracting and bouncing around in there because of these sort of mirrored images of cracks that were refracting the light. So the chunks of glass, I, I broke them up certain ways and some were cracked ahead of time and so when they would go in they would sort of explode or fragmentize on the surface of the object. So I, be I began to actually create, try to create cracks uh, you know, in the process of, of forming them. And you can see the charts of glass and these would all be uh, examples to be studied, explored, and to look at uh, new opportunities. But they were also for me color combinations you can see the yellow with the clear, the textured surfaces. Um, you can see the range of colors that um, uh, we started to achieve. And then trying to understand this sort of cracking thing of, of creating a refractive surface in the object. Um, you know, Steve DiMartino, this uh, gracious to be here tonight, uh, my fractologist, the greatest in the world is here. Um, I knew basically why things crack, just from empirical evidence in my own studio. But I never had a professional person tell me what it really meant, and, to, and I never fully understood it. I thought I did, but I really didn't. When I left Dave's office, I knew I had a lot to learn uh, about what was uh, ahead in the, in the glass world for me. Some of the most interesting things were some of the least uh, predictable. Uh, one of the most interesting one is is uh, the one that uh, on the what is it on on the left that Mike Prentice we were pouring in the in the and I, he said it was an accident. I don't believe it. That the, the pour went to one side a little in in, in the in this cylinder, and the glass started whipping around and flying up and down. And, and Neil said, keep it going, don't stop now. And, this, and uh, so we ended up with, a, a, I think, a very beautiful uh, form. You know, it's both shape and, and, and form. And you can see uh, the range of, of uh, ex exploring this. Here's, these were done the same one after another, and you can see the tall one, and then you can see a much shorter one. And you can see the fragments bursting out of the uh, out of the top of the small one, they are all fused um, into the surface uh, of that. And you can see the color. See the color light, these particular glasses, I won't go into it too deeply, but 
white light is, if you took like fluorescent, incandescent, uh, LED, natural light, they're all white light, but they have different wavelengths. Those wavelengths uh, create different colors under certain conditions. And so you, you see that set of forms here and here. They're the same object, but under different lighting condition, fluore fluorescent and uh, incandescent. So these are very unique glasses. Uh, and uh, Matt must be the most knowledgeable guy in, in the, on the planet with these things. Again, uh, I, I photographed these when I, when I got back to, to uh, my studio uh, and to try to understand them. And, um, you know, you look at this image here and the energy of the glass, you know, it's still captured in this sort of moment. It, it feels like, you know, and I have this. I look at it every day. I put these so I, before I, when I come in the shop and when I leave, I, I see the work that we did. And uh, I feel like this thing's still going to move and change shape. Uh, it's, it's, it's impressive. I built this little light, uh, lighting device uh, that had different light conditions on it. And that if you set the object on it, um, plugged it in, it would go through a range of, of uh, light sources. Um, so I had that in the office, so we would make these forms and different things, uh, whatever it was, and I'd bring them up and, and uh, fool around with this, this box with uh, the lights to see what we, we had. Uh, I began to make my own tube that would fit into this device. Here's uh, Stanley. Early in the morning, it was just Stanley and me here, and here's Stanley giving me advice on, you know, how to drill holes in, in this cast cylinder that I had made. So I consider Stanley a vital part of uh, the success of the project. Uh, at night when I was maybe a little disappointed, maybe in the day's event, he would come in and uh, night we'd clean up the shop and he'd spur me on to the next day. So I started putting embeds and things inside here and, and um, <clears throat> spinning in uh, this crazy machine began to look at uh, gassing out how, how uh, gases form, how bubbles form, uh, at different viscosities in, uh, in glass. You know, I began to explore the properties of that. You can see some of the glasses in the lower part of the image of uh, this Matt's developed up in his laboratory. Matt was taking copious notes continuously. I have no idea what he's writing in there. I thought it was just, you know, what he wanted for lunch or something. But I got to look at it and it was just a series of numbers. Where an artist, where I would draw pictures, Matt would draw numbers. Uh, only he knew what, what they meant. We would look at them under certain light conditions and uh, it was always one day to look and get ready, you know, like sort of maybe, what the hell are we gonna do with, with what we learned today the following day? And. Uh, began to develop the idea that maybe working on the bottom surface, oh, these are all tubes. They're, they're, they're not, when people, the word cylinder and tube, uh, it, it doesn't really define the shape. A tube is open-ended. There's, uh, there's no bottom uh, or, or top to it. It's just a, a, a wall. Uh, and I thought that, well, let's put a bottom on here and see if we can distribute the glass in a particular way, a program surface at the bottom put some device in the bottom that would, uh, with centrifugal force uh, from, from sort of zero the center to uh, say 10 to the outside uh, at high velocity and high impact, what, what, would, what kind of form could that make? So we began to make that and sure enough, the residency was over. So, uh, so here we are. So let's make one tonight.
No, often um, this type of casting, if it's done in a factory, it's often usually one device pours the glass in, whether it's a furnace, a crucible, um, a gather, and stuff. Uh, but we were doing multiple pours, which is very difficult. They came from different locations in the facility. It took a lot of organization and uh, persistence to try to find a way that we could work this out. You can see uh, what a tough job this is, making these things. And uh, Harry and Simak, uh, I, I asked for a torch, and he was kind enough to uh, bring over a torch, and um, it, it didn't work exactly the way we wanted it to for this application. Uh, and David uh, went deep into the uh, research archives over there and came up with this uh, torch uh, that was very successful. Uh, and, and doing what we needed. For those people that don't work with glass, you know, this object is, you know, 17, 18, 1900 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. It's very hot uh, in there. And, and there's only a so, certain amount of time. You have to see that the, you can see the, the redness on the side of this tube. Um, uh oh, what did I do? Oh, shit. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to fool with this. We're going to watch it again. I don't think you paid enough attention to this the first time. I have very sophisticated technology in my facility. But you think I could operate this little thing? Forget it. So he's changing the rate of speed here, too. So by now, we're discovering that at certain rates, the glass is doing specific kinds of things. And, and you know, there's a certain time if you want to get a certain shape, certain results, you know, there's a certain point at which you introduce these, these fragments. You have only seconds, really, to, to be able to remove the, the components of the device that are retaining that uh, cylinder and to get it from there into the annealing oven. Oh, okay. So here we are taking, at the end, of, it, it, it cooled off, and here we are at the end of the day, uh, or the following day, taking it out. And then, you know, there we made two, and one was very successful, and the other um, had these cracking issues and uh, how we were pouring glass issues in it. We had a meeting at a certain time, sort of uh, celebrate that we we're coming uh, to a, near the end of it, and uh, had to make a presentation to the boss uh, <laughs> Carol, and uh, you can see she's, I think she's approving it there. Uh, and Carol and this, you know, Carol, Mike, Mike Pampianki, Pampianko, and Chris Heckel, uh, you know, they really inspired the project. And uh, 
receive, you know, deserve a lot of credit for uh, what was done there. You know, this is the finished uh, tube. Uh, this is under uh, ultraviolet light. Uh, this is, uh, these are two tubes. Uh, these are the, we actually made, I ended up with two sort of objects that you may call finished. It, it, not necessarily in terms of the sculptural potential, but in terms of the, the technical facility that, that, that they have. Uh, and so these two tubes I've been photographing and developing uh, uh, lighting technology for. Uh, my facility, and here they are under ultraviolet light. And here's uh, a grouping of them here in the laboratory, uh, in Neil's lab where we're exploring them. And here's a group uh, of the finished tubes. And here we are, Marilyn and me, uh, photo by Neil Palumbo, celebrating this, this piece. Uh, and these are just a few of the, of the people uh, that I worked with. You can see I'm the, on the shot down in the, in the corner. I'm the tallest one in the group. Uh, Except for Stanley. But you see Corey, you know, Matt in the image. Now, there's, uh, call him Prince Matt with the glass. By now he's got glass growing out of his head. Uh, and it's not a jazz group. I don't think of it. I think of this, uh, this group as a rock band. Uh, this is... These are most of the people that, uh, you know, in the research facility at the working end of things that helped me realize the success, of, I believe, of the residency. You know, uh, you know, Glenn, of course, prominently featured right there in the front. Stanley, Matt, Joe, Dave, Matt, me, Neil, and John. Uh, and there were many others. Uh, but I would like to this uh, tonight to officially thank them and Carol and um, whomever's here representing the uh, the Re uh, Corning Incorporated and uh, CMOG. Uh, thank you. Questions usually there's two. If you talk long enough and long, and there's and it's they're ready to get the hell out of here. There, uh, any questions? Oh, geez, no, no questions. <laughs> Actually, it's not a question, it's more of a comment. W would so, you introduce yourself, please? David McEnroe. <laughs> I was Tom, Tom's kind of third assistant in this. Um, but you saw when he was pouring with the crucible, the chunks of glass into the cylinder as it was spinning. Well, originally, that wasn't our original process. Originally, he had them in his hand, and he would throw them in. <laughs> but unfortunately, he couldn't hit that eight-inch opening. And when he was throwing glasses in, they'd hit the side and start bouncing around. Yeah. So we deemed that a safety hazard. So then we went to the crucible so he could pour the glass well, in. Yeah, another extension of that story is that a lot of them would land on the floor and they started to go all over the environment. Uh, and then, you know, Matt and Dave, everybody started throwing these things in. You know, it was like I said, okay, man, this is now a really a collaboration. You know, it's like everybody contributed to actually what the, thing, the finished piece looked like. And I was in the back room, you know, doing something else, I think. <laughs> But it was great. Are there any, any other questions related? Sure. The 
they have phosphors in them? I, I don't really know. You know, uh, the, how, why did they glow under UV light? You know, on the, in the... In the in the notice that went out on the talk, it talked about that I'd be showing these uh, exotic glasses, this and that. And, uh, there, there are a lot of proprietary things going on with the materials and some of the stuff that I was involved with that I did not show here tonight. Um, and the, the chemistry and that stuff, uh, I would leave to Matt, and I don't think Matt is here uh, this evening. Is he here? Matt Deneka? Is Matt Deneka here? No. Matt's not here, but is, I, I, I can't talk about the chemistry of it. Uh, maybe Glenn can Glenn Char could Char address Charlie says I can. some of it. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the, uh, the fluorescent effect is achieved with different combinations of rare earth ions, so lanthanides, for those familiar with the, uh, the periodic table. And the, similarly, the, the, the glasses that change color depending upon whether they're in dirt. Uh, fluorescent light or incandescent light, those are also based on rare earth chemistries. Uh, so it's a, the work that Matt did, uh, his, his uh, literally world-class knowledge of how to combine those very exotic uh, rare elements into different glass formulations to achieve particular types of effects, the, the brightness, the, the depth of color, the, the amount of pop that you get when you light it up in different ways, that, that's Matt's particular area of expertise and brought a great deal of assistance in that way. But r rare earth elements are rare and they're expensive. Um, That's why I you're trying to steal it away from him in that I was picture. fortunate that I felt, you know, I had unlimited uh, uh, resources of them available to me there. It was never a feeling that uh, there was, uh, that I couldn't uh, do anything that I needed to do in the project. Uh, any other questions? And let's call it a night. <clears throat>So we have um, some, some books on the table over to the right uh, on Tom and his work, authored by Bill Warmus, who's with us tonight as well. And so Tom will sign a copy if you'd like to take one home with you. But otherwise, thank you all for coming. I appreciate your attendance tonight.